The Great Steppe, millenniums of events, hundreds of nomadic tribes and people. They lived, worked, made discoveries, conquered large tracts of lands, and left us some mysteries. To learn more about it, watch the project called Enigma of the Great Steppe. This man lived during the significant changes which took place in the steppe. By nature of his character and leadership qualities, or maybe by someone's higher will, he played a great role in the life of the Kazakhs. He was compared to the steppe Cicero, then to Ivan the Terrible, and everyone emphasized the fact that it was his son who became a great man. And only recently we learned new details about this unusual, contradictory and outstanding person, Kunanbaev Yuskinbaev. Kunanbaev is the only son of Zirech, the first wife of his father. The first year of the family was left to him. He is wealthy and has unlimited power. He is elder than others in his family. Therefore, none of the descendants of his grandfather, Irgizbai, cannot speak out against him. There is one turn on the way to the famous boundary of Zhidibai, which is 180 kilometers far from the Simei city, former Similpalatinsk. It is written Akshoki on the road sign. In a few minutes after this turn, you get to the place where Kunanbai Uskinbaev spent the last years of his life and was buried. Everyone knows him as Abai's father, big feudal sultan, head of the county, B. He was an influential, wayward, and cruel man. But which events influenced Kunan Bai? How did he grow up? How did he change his life? And why was he on the dark frontier between life and death several times? The late Khadji was born in an illiterate environment. He learned to read a bit. Then secretly, he used to take Father Oskinbai's letters, which were sent to Oskinbai from different parts of the steppe, and started reading them and learned to read books in the Turkic language. According to official sources, Kuninbai was born in 1804. To understand his motives and actions, the one needs to know more about the period when he was born. This was a very difficult period. The Kazakhs barely survived after the years of the Great Disaster, invasion of the Jungars, when they decided to go to reapproachment with the Russian Empire. Russia's expansion grew, and by the beginning of the 19th century, the junior and middle Jews became a Russian protectorate. Being a young Jigit, Kunanbaev did not even think that he could become a great man, a ruler, B, Khaji, and that he would have a political career as the starist administration. It turned out that Kunanbaev was more interested in becoming a fighter, Paluan, and doing military exploits. He was a Paluan and fighter and participated in battles. Here are his words. When I turned 21, I fought. I always used to win. Once I suddenly fell and at that moment I realized that there is no grace in this fight and left the fight and never took part in it. Contemporaries and descendants describe Kuninbaev as the lean man, who was almost two meters tall. One of his great-grandchildren, Ahat Kudaybird Uli, looked like Kuninbaev. Oh, well, of course, there are not so many descriptions about his physical appearance, but his grandchildren describe him, and memories of other people also exist. But even on scarce sources, we can be sure that he participated in fights being a young man, that he was very hardy and a tall man. 
Это был такой вот, ну, наверное, об этом будут говорить, вспыльчивый человек, рослый, во-первых, он был рослый и сухощавый. He was a passionate man. He was tall and lean. But Abai was of medium height, well-built, let's say a bit overweight, dark-skinned with a round head. People say that Abai looked like his mother, because his father had an oval face, was lean and tall and a physically strong man. If he got angry, he could easily take and throw a person of 40 pounds weight a few meters far. He was a person of such kind. There is a story about how Kunanbaev, being a jigit, almost died in the struggle with his enemies. He was surrounded, stabbed with a spear, and he managed to escape. He pulled the spear out of his wound and survived. There is another legend when Kunanbaev went blind either during the raids or during arranging Barimita, cattle rustling. It was a disease called shishik. This is smallpox, which affected his eyes. People say he was wounded with a spear, but that's not true. It was smallpox, or maybe it was a plague. And the result of this disease, he lost an eye. Kunanbai got smallpox and almost died. He found a healer. Those days, the healers were called Baksi. The name of the healer was Yirgizbai, of the Naiman tribe. He treated Kunanbai and saved his life. So the reason that Kunanbai was blind in one eye was smallpox. Yirgizbai Ata, a traditional healer, is buried in the Aksuat town. He was from the Kirji family of the Naiman tribe. So Kunanbai almost died of the dangerous disease and survived after the armed struggle. These events could affect the life and he changed life priorities. The life of the steppe also changed. In 1822, the Tsar issued the degree of the Siberia Kyrgyz, which abolished the Khan's power. This degree was followed by the changes which subsequently affected Kunanbai. He was the eldest son in his big family. He had leadership qualities, oratorical talent, and one of his aims was the growth and wealth of his family. How did he build his career? What was the reason of the indelible impression which he left on Europeans? And what was hidden behind the official demonstration of devotion to the Russian Empire? He is a son of the common Kazakh with sanity, sensible memory and speech. He is a great expert on the steppe law and the Holy Quran, who is well acquainted with the Russian statutes about the Kazakhs. He is a judge of the highest integrity and exemplary Muslim. Kuninbai gained the glory of the Prophet and people of the furthest Auls or villages come and ask for his advice. In a few years, common nomad Kuninbai became an authoritative Bi an ambitious steppe politician. If Kunanbai started talking, he could talk for the whole day long. He was an orator and very knowledgeable person. He knew Russian laws well. Thus, he became Aga Sultan, the head of the county. Kunanbai was a very smart man. After the issuance of the Tsar's decree, the colonization of the region began. The Russian authorities became interested in Kunanbai Uskinbaev. After the invasion of Jungars, the steppe was truly in distress and the authorities asked Tsar's governments for assistance. The nomads wanted to establish diplomatic relations with Russia. But instead of this, the Russian officials arrived in the steppe, and according to the degree of Spiransky of the Siberia Kyrgyz, they began to divide the steppe into districts and volus, administrative subdivisions. To make the management of these lands easier, they began to look for assistance among the locals. And the assistants were Tor people, descendants of the Khan's family, and bees illiterate people of the Kyrgyz steppe, whom everyone respected. This is the document dated 1831, the time when he was Sultan. It is written here, Kunanbai Uskinbaev, he is from Kushik Tobukti tribe. 
Since December of 1831, he is Sultan without seal. In the questionnaire of 1842, the following is written. Kunin Bai, son of Uskin Bai, is 36-year-old Sultan. He is very smart and fair enough. He will respect and trust him. In 1840, he was awarded with a brown cloth gown with ribbon by the commander of the Siberian Corps for his devotion to the Russian government. July 6, 1840. The following document is his career list. There is a lot of information about Kunin Bai, Uskin Baev, about his family, about the years when he became Sultan, Aga Sultan. Europeans have learned about Kunin Bai much earlier than about his son, the great poet and thinker Abai. The fact is that in 1846, a magnificent ceremony was held on the acceptance of Russian protectorate by the Kazakhs of the senior Zhuz. Uskinbaev was on this ceremony as a part of the middle Zhuz delegation. In those days, he met Polish exile Edolf Januszkiewicz. The nomad left a deep impression on the foreigner. Then Januszkiewicz published diaries and letters where Kunenbaev was described as a bright, extraordinary personality. People respected him. The Kazakh society, after 250 years of the Jungarian wars, got used to violence and lawlessness. Everyone knows that war is always violence and lawlessness, but lawlessness which is encouraged by the government. That is, murder is punished in calm and peaceful life because it is considered a crime. And during war, to kill enemies is a feat. Yes, they are praised and rewarded for it. And just like, say, to rob a neighbor is considered to be bad action. And to raid the enemies, to take away their children and young women, cattle rustling are also feats. And after the war, there was always a problem in the country. How to calm people, who took part in the war, who got used to violence and lawlessness, who got used to kill. The problem was how to force them to follow the laws. And when people fought during 250 years, then you know that the lifestyle and behavior can change. And then another situation took place. The Jungars were exterminated by the Manchu Qing dynasty of China. And the external aggression of the Kazakhs was replaced by the eternal one. This means internal strives, constant raids, barimta, began to take place. If previously there was the institution of judicial execution, then it was changed to the institution of violence. And Kunanbai grew up in this environment. Being young, he used to arrange barimta. But he began to understand with the age that this was the path to nowhere. He understood that the Russian authorities were not going to stop this because they follow the eternal imperial principle, divide and conquer. He was sure that something needed to be done about it, and he decided to have a career in authorities and put a lot of efforts to abolish this style somehow. In the career list of Uskinbaev, it is stated that he was awarded the rank of coroner for his participation in operations against the rebellious Kinesari. This Khan tried to resist the capture of the Kazakh lands and segregation policies by the Russian Empire, and in the 1830s led the National Liberation Movement. The archival documents show that not all supported Kinesari, and part of the nomadic elite moved to the side of the strong empire. For example, the father of Shokhan, Valikhanov, Shingiz was among them. Kunenbai was also considered a loyal person to the Tsar's government. The interesting fact is that there were some fragmentary stories about how he and his people participated in the operations against the uprisings. One of the researchers, now the late Talas Bek Asim Kulov, collected some legends about Kunenbai and his widow, Zira Nauruzbaeva, and shared some of them. According to legend, he sent Tatimbet to Kinisari for negotiations, and Tatimbet had to ask the question, Arhan, your majesty, what is more, 
the number of the Cossacks or the number of the bullets of the Russian Tsar. We can understand that this armed resistance was beneficial to Tsarism, it strengthened its military presence in the steppe, and so on. But Tatimbet could not ask the question, because Kinisari, with his people, refused to participate in the negotiations. Because Kuninbai, with his diplomatic status, had no right to send an ambassador to the Khan. But Kuninbai understood that those Bais, rich people who were involved in the uprising, who were Kinesari Khan's associates, who used to send him people, horses, money, and cattle and provisions, they were the elite of the Kazakh society. Kuninbaev knew that after the suppression of the Kazakh liberation movement, they would be punished. And what was he doing? It turned out that he instructed his clerk to write the following statements on behalf of these Bais. Kenisari's people broke into our village, did cattle rustling, took away our jigits, our horses, supplies, our money, and we suffered from the violence of Kenisari. And he approved all statements and put his stamp. And then when the uprising of Kinesari was suppressed, he handed over these statements to the Russian authorities. And when the authorities checked these papers, 300 people were sent back to their families from Siberia. Did Kuninbai sabotage the orders of the Russian authorities? Did he assist the rehabilitation of Kinesari's associates? Who knows, perhaps all these rumors have a real justification and new archival documents will show us something else about the steppe ruler. It is true that he was photographed twice. How were the ups and his life changed by the downs? And what kind of relationship did he have with his son Abai? After Kuninbai became Aga Sultan, some people started sending complaints against him to the office. The most serious was the complaint written by Bojé Yeralin about the rustling of 250 horses by Kuninbai. After this complaint, the Russian authorities started the case. Researchers found a criminal case in the archives of the Omsk city, consisting of three volumes with about 1,700 pages. Downs in the life of the Aga Sultan, the head of the country, Uskinbaya, started in 1859, when he was suddenly arrested and sent to the Omsk city. The reason of his arrest was internal strives. Today it is difficult to figure out was it really so or not, but there were a lot of claims of the opponents of Kuninbaev and Uskinbaev's family. Their litigation lasted several years. In the museum named after Abai, there is a copy of the letter of Shingiz Valikhanov, where he vouched for Kuninbaev to the Russian authorities. Shokhan's father brought the defendant Kuninbaev back home. A few years later, the criminal proceedings against Kuninbaev were dismissed for insufficient evidence. Kuninbaev's contemporaries noted his strict character, tough and ambiguous actions. At the same time, he was considered a man endowed with superhuman powers who tried to do something for the people, paid much attention to education. He was the head of social and administrative life of Karkarali County, and there is this mosque built with his efforts in this county. At the age of 70, Kuninbaev performed the Hajj and was among people whose money was used to build a house in Mecca for the pilgrims. One of his good deeds was the memorial arranged to honor his father who can by his memory. His father was B. He died in 1850, and the following year, Kuninbai arranged the memorial. Now we understand that the memorial was arranged not only to show someone's wealth, but to unite people. Kuninbai arranged the memorial on the border near Kokshital. 
People of his tribe and representatives of all three Juzes took part in this memorial. People mention the memorial arranged in honor of Kunanbai's father in Aitz and memories. There is a lot of information about this memorial. One photo of an elderly couple were found in Soviet times. Someone of the researchers suggests that it is a photo of Kuninbaev with one of his wives, Nur Ganim. But these are just assumptions. Well, there were different assumptions. There is an opinion that there are several photos of Kuninbai. For example, this photo, which is in our exhibition, actually this photo is taken from the book, Journeys of the Tsar to the East. This photo depicts representatives of the steppe nobility who took part in the reception, or in the meeting of the Tsar representative in the Omsk city. And according to some assumptions, Kuninbaev was among these people. But these assumptions remain the assumptions. There is no confirmed information who are exactly these people. The assumption is still an assumption. We only know for sure that Shingiz Valikhanov, Shokan Valikhanov's father, is sitting in the center, and the other persons are unknown. This area, called Kaska Bulak, was once one of the places of stays of Kunanbai's village. There is a spring here which, unlike all others, flows to the west. And this area was named after this spring. In the summer of 1845, exactly here, not in Zhidibai as many travelers believe, one of Kunanbai's sons was born. The boy was named Ibrahim. Later people started calling him Abai. In the famous novel by Mukhtar Oezov, The Path of Abai, Kunanbai is contrasted with his son. He personifies the dark past of the nomads. He represents the collective image of the oppressor feudal. But what were the real relations between father and son? Poet and historian Mashkur Jusib Kopeyev once noted that Abai did not make memorial dedicated to his father. One of the explanations is related to the fact that the poet had a creative period at that time. Perhaps poetry and ideas of people in enlightenment have obscured the other things. There is such concept as ethics and moral principles. He always remained Kunanbai's son. Is your father bad or a good person? You do not know because he's your father. Therefore, their contradiction is the contradiction of time, the opposition of generations. Most probably, they had strained and complicated relations, not so complicated as described in the novel. But Abai is the son of his father and the man of his time. People say that one day Abai told his father, this is who I am, and Kunanbai replied, first give a birth to the son like yourself and then flaunt. Now you are not like me. I have a great son like you, but you don't have such a son. <laughs> Kuninbai left a legacy of the boundary Zhidibai to his youngest son Ospan, and when Ospan passed away, these lands passed to Abai. Kuninbai moved to Ashkoki, where he died at the age of 80. Along with Kuninbai, his several children, wives, and other relatives are buried in the family cemetery. Once Kuninbai said, the rich man and the poor man will be equal in generosity. The good man and the bad man will be equal after death. He tried to be fair, to live following the laws. He took part in the changes of the steppe, left his wealth and good name to descendants. In 
we all know that he is the father of the great poet and thinker Abai Kunanbayev.